Welcome to No Code Explorers, the podcast where we relentlessly search for the answer to one singular question. How far can we get without coding? It's been about two and a half years since I first became obsessed with no coding, and I understood that we could develop startup products without any code or with a little code only. Since then, technology evolved so much that now I really want to understand and find out the extreme cases. People who are building very robust products without any code or with very little coding. Want to join me in this exploration? And today we have Jonathan Timianko. Jonathan is the founder of Fearshare, an app that allows boat owners to keep their boats outside of marinas and rent someone else's dock. In this great conversation, Jonathan tells us how he created Fearshare only with Bubble, no code at all, and how he knocked on 3,000 doors to get his first users. I think you find this very inspiring. Let's check it out. Jonathan, welcome to No Code Explorers, man. So I'm excited to, to get to know you better and, and about what you've been hacking and, and doing with No Code. Can we get started by you telling us about yourself, your company, and your product? Sure. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Great to be here. Uh, so my name is Shonda Tomianko. I'm originally from New York, New Jersey, but I'm now in Miami because of coronavirus. Coronavirus got me out of New York. My product is called PeerShare. So PeerShare is at a high level, very simply Airbnb, but for docks for boats. People mm -hmm. sometimes confuse it as renting boats. We're not renting boats. We're just renting the docks. the docks, just like you have an Airbnb property, a person has a house, they want to rent a room in. In this case, it would be a person who lives on the water, has a private house on the water, they have a dock, but they don't have a boat, so the, the dock is empty. And what would happen is boats, instead of boats staying in marinas, whether it be on a long-term basis or a short-term basis, you can have people who are kind of you know, sailing down the coast, or you can have people who actually live in the local communities who need a place to just keep their boat for mm -hmm. months at a time, potentially a year or longer, they can rent the dock uh, through the platform. So we obviously connect the two people, we process all the payments, we manage the legal contracts, handle all the customer service. This business started about, it was actually a mixture of part-time in the beginning. I was working in accounting up in New York. I don't have a technical background. I had worked in business technology consulting. I worked for one of the large consulting companies. So I was in a tech environment with developers, product managers, etc. cetera. Um, but I didn't have any direct coding experience. Mm -hmm. um, so the way the company started was my family had actually moved down from New Jersey to Florida and actually bought a house on the water. And they actually rented their dock to our cousin's friend. And I saw it happen while I was working in an accounting job. So what happened was I like, I knew I had this idea, but obviously I knew nothing about, I mean, I knew a little bit, but I didn't know anything about developing, starting a product. Obviously, you know, this was actually back in like 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. So this was actually before the whole no code yep. phrase came about. There was no like, there was no no code. It was just, oh, there's this platform called Bubble. You can do more on it than anything else out there. So, you know, give it a shot. And I gave it a shot and it's here I am. So uh, walk us through the period between you seeing this first example of your family, like renting the dock to your cousin and the time you decided to make it a business how long did it take what were you considering what was your doubts what, what's the process there so that process was basically like a year and a half long i will mm -hmm. be honest like when, when you deal with no code you know traditionally with startups it's like first month or two we'll build a prototype then we'll raise money then we'll two years later it'll be tons of users that that wasn't my path so what happened was was 
the boat docked at my family's house. The guy who owned the boat gave my dad some money for the dock. And I just said to myself, okay, there is some market here. First off, actually, what I want to mention is the boat was very big. It wasn't like a small boat. It was Mm -hmm. quite a large boat. So the fact that it was a very large boat for a guy that necessarily he, he could afford the marina, but he decided to come here to some guy's house. He just decided to do it and, and he gave money for it. So I was like, okay, there's definitely some market here for people keeping boats behind people's houses. Mm-hmm. That market, I don't know how big it is, but it's something. So I saw, and you know, it's not too dissimilar of a story from like the Airbnb guys, you know, they, they like put a guy on a mattress in their house. Like I'm not where those guys are now. (laughs) I'm very (laughs) far, but um, they, you know, they, they put a guy on a mattress in their house, the guy paid for it. And they're like, Oh, you know, it turns out people will stay behind, you know, in random people's rooms and there may be a market, maybe not. So suddenly it becomes possible, right? Someone paid for this. So, right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the next, I was still working full time in, in accounting. So really the next year and a half, it was really a, a combination of me learning how to build on bubble. So I spent a couple months doing that. I know they don't want me to say it takes a couple months. They say it takes <laughs> like eight to 10 hours, but everyone's different. But, you know, I think the next couple months was, I, I just think the magic moment for me, like when you... I had the idea going from just the idea to like, okay, something launches. That is a very long and protracted journey. Yes. I think really like the magical moment for me where I realized like I could take this further was the idea that Bubble really gave me all the tools to actually build everything. I think Mm -hmm. when you don't come from a technical background, like the first thing, the first thought I had in my mind was, okay, I'm going to have to raise money or I'm going to need an engineer or something. So I actually was playing around with like WordPress first. I was just, I was like the first three or four months was literally just an exploration into the idea of whether, can I actually build this on my own? Am I able to do that? Do I have the tools necessary to do that? And, you know, usually the answer is no, but Bubble is that tool that allows you, that gives you the empowerment and the abilities to build it. So what's funny is like when you're an entrepreneur and you want to have something big, like in in a weird way, you like, you kind of humble yourself in the beginning where you think to yourself, like the the moment you learn where you actually can, you don't need to rely on other people. You can actually carry it forward. That was like the biggest thing for me. Like the, like the idea that I just had the ability to even have the opportunity to spend four months learning something it's not like i would say to myself oh i spent four months learning coding and then i can't build what i need but in this case like bubble convinced me that i could spend four months or three months and i really could actually have the skills to build the whole business so Mm -hmm. you know the first year was really just um it was just like an exploration into whether i could do this myself and then on that was the technical side on the business side i didn't see too many, I didn't see any other competitors for what we're doing, but more importantly, and this was kind of like the next stage in the business development, whether it's a market, I actually found a couple of uh, classified ad websites from like probably built in the nineties of people listing their docs on these random classified sites, giving up their addresses, just like Craigslist, but like there were specialized websites for doc for rentals. Doc. So I was like, Oh, you know, People are listing, they, people, doc owners were actually paying money to be listed on these specialized doc classified ads. They weren't actually even, some of them were doing Craigslist and some of them were doing these sites, but there were people who were like, I actually called people, I called a thousand of these people off the internet. Like that was the next stage of like getting the customers, but there were people who would pay the listing fees for the doc classified ad websites. And I was like, okay, the boat came to my house on the listing side, the the doc owners are paying money to be listed. They're not paying money to be listed if nothing's happening. So there must be boats going to those docs that are being listed. Otherwise people wouldn't pay that money. So those were those three things coming together, like boat at house, 
listing, technical, those all came together in the first year to really get it on the path it needed to be. I want to comment on, on two things. Uh, actually, it's one theme, but two examples. It looks like you had the expectation of bringing a startup to the world without the, the year and a half of figuring it, it out that led to execution uh, later on. And I, I, I would love to address this because I think that's what most people think that, that should happen, right? In my experience, almost all founders go through this period anyway. You, you can be a, an engineer, you can be a, um, a veteran founder, but ideas need to brew, right? I love that you took the year and a half that it usually takes. And let's say it's anywhere from a year to couple of years like maturing the the idea and i love also the fact that you took the four months to learn bubble in this part specifically I, th i think i agree that's too aggressive to say that in a few hours you can build of course if you've been doing this for a long time and built many many products you can in a few hours build something with bubble but the learning curve is there and most people when they understand that they would need more than like 20 hours of investment just to figure things out and then they, they would like to start building they give up and you went through that period uh, of course with uh, resilience persistence and resourcefulness I, i would love that people uh, listening or watching this understand that of course if you're going to build a product be it with code with no code whatever there is skill involved you need to understand how a product works for example in, in the case of bubble like how workflows work uh, what what's the logic behind of this and then, then you go through that even when you had uh, experience with tech consulting before you need to go through that i had to, to go through it many many times so i i, I love this uh, as as we start getting to know your story that you went through the the learning curve that's necessary man well i mean just one thing i would say to summarize all that is it's just i think when you're starting a company as an entrepreneur i, I think that there's a divide between technical coding individuals and founders and business people in their expectations of what the early days are like because i think i come from the camp of people where i say to myself this is going to be really difficult there's not too many people doing this because it's really difficult and if it was easy everyone would be doing it but then you have like that's what i would say when starting a company but on the technical side i think people would say oh yeah i'll just put a couple lines of code together we'll string it together we have a product and it'll be good And that may be true for those technical people, but I think the magic of no code is that it's just this intermediary medium between those two mindsets where it basically, a little hard to explain, but it kind of, it grounds you in a way. Like the tool, the tool keeps you grounded by giving you the ability of what those technical people doing do easily, but you can have that mindset also that it's going to be really tough at the same time. You can have like that mindset and you can continue forward in a sustainable way mm -hmm. where, because I, you know, I was just telling a friend like the other day, like, you know, you may have competitors that come up, things may happen, but there are like a million things that can go wrong in the startup journey. And that's why most companies don't make it. And I think that one of the things that really just kills startups, I mean, it's easy to say this now because I have bubble, but I hope this will be what everyone's saying like 10 years from now. It's just, it's, there's so many things that can go wrong. And I think that the main thing that goes wrong is you just built, you built the wrong thing. You spent money on building the wrong thing you couldn't raise the next round of money. So then you have to fire all the engineers and then the technical that the, all the engineers are gone. And then all you have left is the business person, but he can't build it. And then the company doesn't exist anymore. Just what no code does is it allows the people who have my mindset that this is going to be really tough. Let's take our time doing this. It gives those people the ability to build the product in the correct way at the correct pace without, I mean, it's like at no cost. There's at no cost, basically other than the bubble fees per month. And you can build the company in the right way. And as a result of that, there's going to be a lot more tech companies in the future than there were before this because of that. 
Yes, I agree 100%. I think we're going to see the trend of non-technical founders making it happen uh, or even, I don't know, engineers who know how to code but decide to build their own thing with no code because it's easier to share with their co-founders. More, more things w- will happen and I agree 100% we're going to see an explosion of new startups. Well, I think also in terms of... Um what the tool does, right? I think the reason Bubble is so unique is because it's really the only one that is, it's like automated web development for everyone. It's a coding platform. People should call it a coding platform, not necessarily like, oh, it's a web app builder. Because then when people hear web app builder, they think, oh, it's like a website builder, more advanced than Wix, and it does more stuff. Template based where you can drag and drop things, but it's much more than that, right? Right, and the fact that you can bring in code into bubble and the fact that it's hybrid means that it's really a tool for everyone developers developers every developer should be using bubble because it automates the stuff that they don't want to do yeah. and it lets them, it strips it automates all the stuff no one wants to do and leaves the stuff everyone wants to do and nothing more and nothing more and that's really what what it's about so tell me after the year and a half like putting things together and making and learning etc what happens when you launch your your product well nothing happens because no one cares when you launch it's just with like no one goes viral overnight i mean there's some exceptions but i never had the expectation that when i launched thing people were going to start listing people were going to start doing this i i knew i would have to fight for it so so we launched um it was like a soft launch in 2017. I was still working. Really, the, the company started early 2018. So that's really when we started. That's when boats started coming. I'd say spring of 2018. That's when boats started coming. So when I launched, shortly after I launched, I mean, I did a little more than an MVP, but everyone's guilty of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it read at hindsight's 2020 on that all the time. But um, after I launched, I knew that I would have to manually go and get the dock owners. I have to build up the supply side first. And so it always has to come. So I called a thousand people with docks off the classified sites and I walked to over 2000 houses and knocked on 2000 doors. Amazing. And I just like, again, just as like, as a business person who's not a coder, I don't want to disparage coders. Maybe they're not all like this, but coders don't do that they just they don't they don't go knock on those doors I, yeah i think and i just i hope that i mean there's exceptions potentially but it's two different mindsets and my mindset was okay i got the mvp out i built the initial for me what's funny is knocking on those doors as like a business person that i am and like a sales type guy that was easy that was mm-hmm. the easy part. Mm-hmm. It, it was getting getting the actual product to a point where I would have the ability to knock on those doors. That was that was much more difficult. Yeah. And I actually had a friend a friend who knows knows me very well. He said to me, like, just just handle the initial MVP. Once you get there, like, you'll be doing the stuff, all that stuff. And what's funny is I actually prefer the development more than. <laughs> the That's amazing. So, uh, as of now, it, it goes, it, it goes in flux, but I can tell you in, in the first three years, the toughest thing. So we got the MVP out, but now I had boats actually coming to dock. So as you can imagine, how long between the MVP out and the first boat coming? It launched like early 2018, but I did like one boat at a dock in November, 2017, just like, just to like get something just like get just get someone to pay it perfect we'll do that i think between i think we had another boat come in january and then the first like boats i think between april and july is believe it or not some of those boats that came in april and july they're still there today <laughs> so what's crazy is is the boats came in when it was an mvp but now there's a mobile app and there's like a group of dockings where like, they're kind of just like, they're lost in the system. Set and forget. It's just like the database was like changed so many times. The, like, it's just on a manual Google, Google calendar type thing where I'm like, okay, I know the boat is there. Cause no one told me it has, it's left yet. It's just, it's on autopilot. Like it doesn't, the tech doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if those yes. initial 
it doesn't matter if those initial people see like the old version of the app or the new person, or the new people. All that matters is the boat is there and it's paying. And that's it. Mm-hmm. That's all that matters. One question around the, the business. So for example, those boats are still generating revenue for you. That's right. Yeah. I, I think that was like three years ago. So most of the ones from three years ago left, but I think we still have like three or four that came in in like 2018. They're, mm-hmm. they're still there. They could yeah. be there another 10 years. Like, I don't know. So this, uh, I want to point this out because um, as a business person, you found out, uh, I don't know how, how much of this was intentional, but you found out a higher um, lifetime value for your business than, for example, might be even the case of Airbnb. I, I, I'm not sure. That in itself gives you the time you were, you're mentioning that you want so much of building it in the right pace. I think that's a great point you mentioned. You hit a lot of things there and it's a lot of different pieces about what you said I think about a lot. So I'll kind of I'll kind of break it down. So Please. you are completely correct that the difference between Airbnb and myself is that when you look at the lifetime value of the customer, I do strongly believe that yes, it is unbelievably higher than Airbnb. But the thing is, the logistics of getting the lifetime customer are much more complicated Cactus than Airbnb. High. What's happening here, so what, in terms of the fee structure, the way it works is I only charge the boater a 10% fee. So if a doc's listed, if a doc owner wants to earn $1,000 a month, the boater pays $1,100 per month. But the way we structure it is to give value to the boater we make it completely flexible. So there's no like long-term lease. They can get preferred pricing based on how long they want to stay. The payments are processed securely. We don't charge the dock owner a fee. So we, we give, it, it's a very delicate financial model. It's, this is not a case where like a boat is coming. It's a one-time thing. You charge both sides, they leave and they don't come back again. These are people in the local community who are paying. It's like an apartment for their boat in a way. So what's happening is people are actually, they're visiting the dock spaces before the, the boats even get there because they need to inspect it like an apartment because there could be rocks in the water. So I would say that the lifetime value of that boater, if you bring the boater into the system, the lifetime value of that customer is higher. And in terms of no code and development, having that income, that residual income from those boats that stay there a while keeps the, the revenues of the company very stable. So even during coronavirus in the last year, I was obviously when Corona started, I was like, oh my God, all these boats are going to leave. People are going to sell their boats. There's an economic catastrophe. This comp- you know, That's the first thought that goes into your head. But surprisingly, it actually stayed very stable and we're doing better now. We basically grew our revenues like 10 to 20% monthly in Corona which means it's a very, it's very stable income and the high lifetime value of the customer is higher, but the logistics of those boats, the conversion rate of people who open a request and then actually bring their boats there, that is a tougher challenge. And obviously if you have more docks and you have more choices and the marketplace grows and then obviously the chances you're going to convert a customer go higher, but it, it's much more challenging, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's kind of a pro and con. The pro is you have the residual income where it's just, okay, it's stable. You brought the boat in, let's keep it going forward. But at the same time, it's, it's harder. It's harder to, for me to get 40 boats at docks up to a hundred boats at docks at the same time than it would be for Airbnb, but the reward is greater. So initially you went door to door and you talked to 1,000 suppliers, 2,000 potential clients, and you matched them initially as, as best as you could. Are you still doing more like sales approach, the, the, the doing things that don't scale approach? Or did you transition to, I don't know, digital marketing strategy or even product, uh, product-led product growth strategy? What, what's the, the, the current stage in terms of- Yeah, no, so that's a good question. So, you know, obviously there's always a hybrid, right? Like you're always doing non-scalable things all the time. So 
In terms of, yeah, there's a def- couple different components here. So I would say we're at the point now where, so we actually built up a blog. We, we were very, I was very big on content marketing and Google and getting the traffic up organically. Cause I mean, you, know, you don't want to pay for ads. Like no one wants to do that. And, you know, if you get your content strategy right and you build up your content. So here's the thing, right? That takes time, it takes effort, it takes persistence, it takes all that stuff. It's never easy, but it, it's a long-term thing that pays off. So um, I started the, we started the blog like a year ago, year and a quarter, uh, year and a half. So, so we basically have between six and 8,000 new people from Google finding out about our product, no marketing budget. We have the traffic coming in from Google. In the beginning, it was literally just, I, would, I was actually listing some docs on the classified sites and then bringing them mm-hmm. over to me, just like Air, just like know, Airbnb you know, did. You, you, you're following that lead. Right. Not automated, just like, okay, just bring them to me. So that's how we got at the first few boats at docs. In terms of going forward, I would say in the last year, in the coronavirus year, before we got the app out, I was still doing a lot of very manual. What was happening was people were coming to the site. So we automated the process of people coming to the site, but the actual act of them getting to the dock and actually paying, I had to do on the phone manually because we just didn't have that part developed. So the way to think about it is, is you do the stuff manually, you don't have developed and you figure out what your challenges are, what your priorities are. And then you develop that and then that piece becomes automated and then you go on to the next thing. So where we're at right now is I'm decently very happy with the amount of people coming in from Google. The thing that's tough now is really converting those people into customers. I, you, know, you don't know who's visiting your site. You have, to, you have to build the user experience and the design of the website and everything in the right way so people convert. So we're trying to crack the whole conversion issue right now people are they're submitting requests i have people signing up like it's happening but it's not it's like this we want to make it go like this really all my time i have a part-time blogger she does the content marketing she's very good and you know she's been incredible the last year um what's being done now is really a combination it's really mostly product it's it's just in a weird way like i was in the build phase in the first year, then I went into, okay, let's get boats at docs, let's get docs listed. Now, in that period, you obviously learn all of the terrible things that could happen. You throw yourself into the fire, you learn all the stuff that could go wrong. And that's all feedback. That's there. Those customers are going to teach you how to build every aspect of your product so it can scale. So listen, this stuff takes time. Like, you know, we're talking about four months to learn bubble, then a year and a half of market research, then you do a year, all those transactions, and then you did that. And then now I feel I'm in really in the proper build mode right now where it's like, okay, we, we know we did the initial part. We got the customers, we got sales. Now it's about really getting ready for going from 40 boats to 400 at a time. And all of that product development is all happening right now, all by me, because I have no code and it makes no sense to get anyone else. You're gonna grow slower, it's gonna be more difficult, but my gamble is that it would pay off better, not just in terms, I'm not just looking out for myself, but I'm looking at in terms of how can I take the company the furthest on the least possible amount of resources? Just how can I take it the furthest I can? So what what's happening now is we're, I'm redeveloping the entire user experience, making it easier, and uh, we'll see what happens. It's an interesting time. One, um, I think for, I would say my my style of entrepreneurship is similar to yours in the sense of wanting to do things one step at a time and learning between each step. And that, that I think it, is uh, incredible because even if you had a thousand no-code developers working in your product, you need the learnings from the business in order to decide what to build. So it doesn't make sense to build it all fast. 
I mean, I can't say I'm going in a different direction. I'm still building the same company, but the mechanics and the logistics of this, it's a, you know, at the end of the day, I'm building a unique scale, trying to build a unique scalable user experience around the idea of boats coming to docks. There's a lot of logistical complexities. You know, I just think it's so dangerous when companies, they don't know what's happening and then they hire people to build something it's just the classic mistake. Like they're, you know, one, ex- I think just there's one point I want to make about like the big companies like Airbnb, Uber, et cetera. I think that it's, it's much easier relatively. It's much easier to hire, you know, venture capital team developers when what you're doing is you're, you have a transaction where it's like, okay, quick, easy, in and out, one and one and done, paid, gone, finished, which is, that is Uber, press button, car comes, person takes ride, person leaves. Obviously they executed their development team. They they executed their product with their development team in the best way. And that's why they are where they are. But I think just, I think people, what they do is they take the mindset that like, you can do that for every product. I know for this product, there's so many logistical complexities of what goes on with these boats where it's if you had like an engineering team that just built something scalable and great and then you give it to users it just it would be wrong i know it would be wrong because it's just so unique when you have like a i think what i would say to like all everyone watching who's you know trying to start something is if you have any i if you have any suspicion in your mind that what you're going to be building is a complex transaction or something where it's not just like a restaurant order or like a car ride, I would highly encourage you to really, and you should do this for any business, but especially for these businesses, you need to spend a year just in the weeds with your customers, learning every single step of what they're doing for that transaction, because they will teach you how to build It can be built with the technology you have. Anything can be built, but it has to be built the right way. You're going to build it wrong if if they don't teach you how to do it. Do you think there will come a time where past this phase you said, like the proper building phase, where you, you found a great fit with the demand? Conversion is great. Retention is great. And the problem, the complex problem is solved. Do you think there will come a time of accelerated growth afterward? Uh, yes, that I do want to do that. Um, I want to do it at the right time. In a weird way, like if you do a no-code startup and you get it to that point where there's like 400 boats at a time, you can very easily fall into the trap of it being quote-unquote a lifestyle business. People use that term. I don't like, honestly, that term carries, it's very pejorative in a lot of circles and people use it the wrong way. In my definition, like if you have a business where you love what you're doing and it, and it gives you the lifestyle that you want and you don't have to report to anyone and you're happy to me, that's the American dream to some people, Silicon Valley may call that a failure. I I don't know. Maybe some people would, some people wouldn't, but I would say, I mean, obviously if I, I think when you get to that point, you know, you're always going to want, if you're hungry as an entrepreneur, you're always going to want to get to that next level. So eventually when you reach that level, the goal is to get to that next level. Now the question is, should we hire? I think really, I think the goal is the same. The goal is to get big. The goal is to have this be everywhere. Of course, I want this everywhere in the world. I can't say that I don't want that. But I think that when we reach that point, Hopefully, when we reach that point, I, I don't think the question is going to be, oh, should we go global or should we go this? I think the question is really going to be, should we use the company funds to hire someone and keep the equity in the company and, and avoid outside investors until later? Or should we do it at that point in time? There's a lot of complex issues there, but I would say that um, the goal is that, de- I mean, there's no question the goal if if we can get to that point right now, you know, revenues like this, if I can get it to this point where it's looking like that, then, you know, absolutely. We'll start to have those conversations in a weird way. I may be looking back at this like three years from now and realizing, Oh, maybe I didn't need to raise money. Maybe, maybe I, 
we have to just see what what happens you know it's, there's a lot but the goal is to get there yeah and of course uh what i uh, i think there is the all, all those decisions to make and once the time comes you, you're gonna know what you need do, do you need capital to grow or do you need uh do, do you have uh, a cash cow that's generating revenue you can you can continue bootstrapping etc but the the biggest question and I'm, i'm asking you based on my experience with let's call it less scalable less immediately scalable businesses there's always the question mark will this actually be scalable uh, eventually or will this always continue to be like a more complex operation that that needs to scale less but i but i got your point the, you, if it if you get there you're going to grow with what presents itself uh, the need that presents itself right well one thing i want to say off of that is um The term scalability is tossed around a lot. Everyone has different definitions of that. I would say, you know, this is something I really think about a lot. It's the, you know, right now, I think we have like 45 dock spaces that have boats. You know, you can, if you go to the website, there's like a section where it shows all the places. That, so when you talk about scalable, I think it's good to keep this into perspective, right? Right now, I am a part-time person have about 45 dock spaces that are rented out. And we're doing that in a home office with one computer and nothing else. That is scale. The only, <laughs> the only people, the only people in the world that manage 45 dockings at a time are entire marina offices on site in person. So just on this basis, just on the basis of 45 from a home office. The fact that we're doing that now and collecting those revenues off of one person in a home office makes me believe that a team of 20 to 30 can handle thousands upon thousands. And, and I just think, again, this is where Bubble comes in again. I'm going to plug the tool for them again. Bubble makes businesses that you wouldn't think be scalable actually scalable because I don't need to hire all those engineers. The people, I can do more with a smaller team than would be possible um, in, in the traditional engineering landscape. And I would, say that, I would say that this business almost couldn't exist with traditional engineering yeah. because, and it's not just about, I don't think it's really so much about, like, I, I think it would be very difficult to get to the point of, you know, the Airbnb level. But I just think that because of the complexities and the transactions, I'm going to need more people doing a traditional customer support on that basis. And I'm only going to have a certain pot of money to reach from in revenues in the company in order to do that. So, you know, it gives the opportunity for me to spend money on what's needed for the business and not just all these engineering resources, that's a huge overhead. It gives you more, more room, you know? Definitely. And especially if you, and I think for marketplaces and products like, like yours, I think that the answer is yes. But if you think you can build your product in the long term with Bubble, that's, that's the best. Uh, there's answer. a lot of people. I was just at dinner last night across the table For me, was a mobile engineer, very nice guy, friend of a friend. He told me you won't be on Bubble three or four years from now. I told him, eh, maybe, but I think, I think you're, I, there's, let me tell you, I, I don't think that's true because, you know, if we have 400 boats at docks three or four years from now, guess what? Those 400 people, there are, four, there are hundreds of people using the app now as it is the way we have it. They're fine. They're doing fine. It's working. It's doing what they need to do. They're paying for stuff through the app. There is literally, in my opinion, no difference between having a couple hundred people versus a couple thousand people doing it three years from now and being able to make quadruple or more of the money. It, 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 that's the thing. Like People just make this mistake that like you need the most advanced technology now for a small group of people. 
your the technology and and the 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 level of adv- of advanced the advanced level of the technology that you give your users should it should grow with them you know you shouldn't and that's just with traditional engineering or that's with no code you you need as your users grow your app gets better people will always complain as you go along that the app doesn't have this or the app doesn't have that if you are a responsible founder who actually replies to customer service inquiries and actually answers those people and doesn't just ignore them any lack of of any anything that the app doesn't have that you can't have now can just be made up with by a customer support message and calling them on the phone so my the only thing that would prevent me from going off bubble is they don't take the platform further but given that they just raised raised 100 million dollars it, it I, looks I like bubble is going to be here for a while i don't think that's going to happen and frankly even if it just stayed the way it was right now and didn't get any better i mean we can have you know we can have thousands of boats with what we have now and so i don't even those people are thinking about like it's just so easy for engineers to think okay you need all this crazy stuff now but the 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 entrepreneur the business person in me is wants to be conscious of the amount of money spent and just again going as far as possible on do you making most of the limited resources we have right now yeah that's amazing uh the way we are thinking about this podcast is to, uh, we want to discover how far can we get without uh, coding and with no code platforms and as as you just said there's a, a lot of people who who are on one side who think this is uh, you use no code for for a period of time and then you migrate and other people who think you can do it forever and from what you said i think you're you're more um on the center which is we'll take it as far as i can take it I can never predict you i can't predict what bubble will look like two to three years from now so i know what's what they have today works for me great today um so i'll just you'll see you'll reassess you know yeah that's the cool thing about no code you don't need to make the decision for life and you don't you don't need to start by making plans to throw it out uh, also you don't need to start by saying okay i'm gonna be married forever to bubble or i'm gonna do this for six months and then i'm gonna hire an engineer team like you can make money along the way and exactly. make your decision uh, later on. One quick thought on that is, so let's say you build the bubble app and then you decide to go full engineering. What people don't realize is by building the bubble app, you literally just provided the entire roadmap for the engineer to build it. So all they have to do, I mean, bubble obviously doesn't want me saying this, but uh, I feel like I've given them enough credit this call. I can kind of throw this <laughs> All an engineer would have to do is say, okay, show me the database, show me what this does. They literally just go through the application and they replicate it on code and it's all there. It's like the roadmap is there. They just have to convert it. So there's no, there's literally no time wasted on yeah. no code. And even if you didn't have that, the the value you gotten, we've gotten from the validation and the business you created with yeah. it would justify throwing it out and building it over Absolutely. again. So 100%. yeah, uh, but you don't need to. I have one uh, extra um, idea to throw around here, which is something I'm experimenting with, which is you can phase out from no code if the, right. the situation um, arises where you, you need custom code. For example, you can have the full app there and integrate with a custom API you, you create right. for artificial intelligence, blockchain, whatever you, you want to do, the fancy thing with tech. And you can make Bubble use this. You can integrate the two and slowly build your custom tech and slowly remove things from Bubble. Bubble Webflow, I'm, uh, of course, any, any no-code tool. The, today, there are many who do the trick. Uh, um, in contrast to when you started, right now you can you have a menu of possibilities of, on how to start a business like yours. The the hybrid nature of Bubble, what it does is, you know, one thought in terms of going off, the one thought I've always 
the the thing that makes me most want to go off bubble note, they're going to fix it next year or the year after, but obviously having a very slick, fast performing mobile user interface on the front end is they're really drastically they don't have right now. Yep. Um, so like you said, you know, just like I mentioned, traditional developers can mix code into bubble, you know, in terms of the entire product, what you can do is you can have a, a developer do the custom front end and then use the bubble database and their back end. That's the beauty of it. It's, you're not just, it's not like, okay, you build this in Wix and if it's not in Wix, it's over. It's, it's the hybrid approach. The modular and hybrid open approach is what is so unique about them particularly. And um, no, I agree. Like the options always there. It just, it's, it, the options always there. The question is, do you ever want to exercise it? But I think you bring up a great point in saying like, you know, it shouldn't just be like an all or nothing thing where it's like, okay, you either have it or you throw it out. It's do it in phases and, and if you have to. If, if you have to. And of course, uh, Bubble's um, strength, uh, actually Bubble weakness in terms of the mobile friendly UI, et cetera, et cetera, is Webflow's strength, for, for example, in right. building right. very, very uh, good uh, design and UI thing. And they're complementary in terms of Webflow is very good at this, Bubble is very good at that. And you could have what you said, you said, just said, like doing the front end somewhere else and integrating with the back end in Bubble, the logic, the, the flows, et cetera. But you can yeah. also have like, 100% Webflow and do custom code in the backend and integrate with, with Webflow CMS, for example. There are so much more ways of building product today than there were when I started that I'm very, very excited to see what comes uh, ahead of us in terms of new business, great business like yours uh, being born without the, the pain of having to deal with multiple failures of hiring engineers didn't work out or, or it was working out great. And, but then they, they joined uh, Airbnb, his team. And the, no, exactly. And um, you know, Josh, I think Josh and Emmanuel, you know, the founders of bubble, they said, I think on another podcast, I watched one of them and the, the podcast director you know, personality said, uh, where do you want no code to be 10 years from now? And they said, I don't want the term no code to exist. I just want it to be, okay, like this is the way software is built in 99% of cases. And that's the end of the story. You know, think about it, right? Like people aren't saying, oh, how are you going to write up that Word document today? Are you going to hire a, a typist? Are you, gonna, you know, and just, oh, we go into Word, we print and the world is great. I, I just think, I think that the whole no code movement hopefully to be retired and, and using that term in a couple of years, but it really is the biggest, it is the biggest transformation to tech since the creation of the internet, even more important than the iPhone. I, I really believe it because um, all these businesses that would not exist, all these products that would not exist, they are going to exist eventually, you know, it takes time to build and they will exist. It's just the start of the, of the transition, right? So, Yep. We're going yep. to see a lot in the future. This was a great, great, great conversation. I love your take Thank on you. things. I love when I talk to, to grounded founders who, <laughs> who are doing the business. I'm, I used to say to founders, the first step to, to do a startup is to sell something to someone and you went to and knocked on 3,000 doors. So it's uh, amazing what you're doing, man. Thank you so much. Hey, for, no, I, I appreciate the time. It's great talking with you. Thanks so much. I hope you got excited to build your own thing with no code after this conversation. And if you want more, please follow me on LinkedIn and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming service. I'm Daniel Weinman, and this was No Code Explorers.